Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. No matter where you go, there you are. It might be a line from my favorite movie, but it also uh, it also works with the show that I just watched. And uh, if you're within the sound of my voice, then you must be in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt. I am the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brains on... Not only current projects, but uh, how they got started, state of the industry, all that sort of fun stuff. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, I, we'd love it if you did. You could uh, do so over at Apple, over at Spotify, or you can find every episode archived over on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'd love it if you follow us on social media as well, either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all the latest updates. And finally, please visit us where it all started over at In The Seats, in the seats.ca for all sorts of fantastic movie news, reviews that our crack team is working on. Well, not 24-7, but pretty close. <laughs> we, we work hard, because uh, we love it. But uh, that leads into, my, leads into this episode and who we're talking to today. We're talking with comedian Sarah Pascoe about her brand new show... Out of Her Mind, which has, uh, well, it's available on uh, a few VOD platforms here in Canada, but only in the West Coast. It's actually an exclusive to uh, TELUS Presents in a few uh, provinces, I believe BC and Alberta, but it might be coming to us, but it's, it's really this fantastic series it's about family it's about relationships and it's written by written and starring sarah pasco and it it sort of breaks from the traditional sitcom form and it's very meta and it's very insightful and borderline philosophical really she's playing a version of herself uh but you know someone with the moodiness and sort of temperament of an adolescence <laughs> adolescent and she kind of dresses like a six-year-old but it's it's set uh, in the midst of her sister's wedding preparations, and she doesn't understand why the world is pairing up and having babies, and she's convinced she's the only sane person out there, and you know she has to prove that romantic love is just you know biology and and social conditioning, and uh, no one really quite appreciates her, but it it's really a sort of a deep dive into the psyche of so many things, not just for this character, but for this performer as a writer, and it's really one of those things that it makes you smile, it makes you laugh, but it makes you think too, and uh, we got uh, the exclusive opportunity to sit down with Sarah Pascoe and talk about uh, the show, sort of how it got started, how uh, she found herself... uh, being a writer and being a comedian and uh, lots of other fun stuff. It's a short one, but it's a good one. Hope you like it. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> now, I mean, obviously, I guess just to just to kick it off, I just want to say congratulations on the show. I, I absolutely loved it. And I mean, I think it was probably the most relatable piece of sort of writing stand-up that I've ever seen sort of translated into a show. Can you walk me through sort of the initial inspiration to do the show and especially the way that you wrote it? Um, yeah, so so I didn't, absolute, um, I didn't absolutely know what the show was going to be when I started, but I did know I wanted to be hugely introspective, which is kind of very comfortable for a comedian. That's kind of where we go. But I also wanted to have um, this process where every time Sarah's talking about herself, she's also talking about humanity in general as a species, hence a lot of the kind of evolutionary history. So I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. Is this, I mean, I can imagine it might have been a hard pitch because, I mean, so much of it really plays like a piece of memory because there's parts that's the show, there's parts that there's there's narration, there's introspection, there's, it's really sort of flipping back and forth on many levels. Yeah, I think it is a hard pitch. I think if I had originally said to the BBC and Sony, like, oh, hey, guess what? I want to make a really weird show just about myself, um, they might have... um, 
said no but there were all these stages to it where I've written a couple of books which are humorous let's say but they are about evolutionary history and my interest in um I guess um the evolution of sex um in our species as but I did have a, um, a bit of that and then I did a pilot which was just about monogamy kind of trying to disprove monogamy so there were all these stages along the way where I was kind of saying to them this is the kind of thing I want to do um but yeah before the series is it is it more creatively satisfying for you to have something where obviously there's going to be an in and then an out as opposed to you know trying to sell it for a season two kind of thing well I think um you know like making a series was always a dream like with lots of comedians you do spend a lot of time kind of fantasizing in your head what would I make for, for years and years I thought about credit sequences and for ages I thought it would be a bus and then when I was writing I was like no it's going to be a tube train and I'm dancing um I had like that idea was so um visual to me but yeah having an out I really wanted it to sit, sit by itself satisfactorily rather than do this dangling, please recommission me. I really wanted it to just <laughs> exist by itself because if it's the only thing I ever get to make, I want to be really pleased with it rather than oh, heartbroken that I didn't finish it properly. I, I got to ask you more about the tube credits opening because I absolutely love that. I mean, not just the fact that you did it in the tube, but just that it was different every time. Yeah. Um, we did that. We actually filmed more in about 20 minutes on the end of a day when some, a scene earlier had overrun. So they were like, you've got two takes on each one. Go like that. And the poor extras were so tired that they didn't have to pretend to be kind of like bored commuters. They were really just like, just hit the bell and let us go home. <laughs> when you're writing something like this, how do you draw the line sort of between Sarah the person and Sarah the character? Or is there one? There isn't one really in terms of performance. Like I, I, I got asked a lot when I was doing press here, like, oh, is she a version of you? And I thought, no, she really, she isn't a version of me. But because, but often to protect other people, actually, what you try and do is explain something that feels really true to you, but that isn't exploiting another person's life. Like because I've got my family in it or right. people representing a family, um, I had to be very careful because often you know a child I mean like me being the child the ver my version of my childhood isn't the same as my parents version of my childhood things like that and um, someone um, used this brilliant quote for me the other day my friend's a writer and she said oh the quote what you say is all of it's true none of it happened and that's really helped me to focus it but of course it all it was all subjective feelings but not a literal biography. It is is part of this whole process I mean especially sort of being a comedian and sort of being in that world really sort of involve exposing a certain nerve, but trying to do it in a certain way and trying to make it sort of entertaining as opposed to sort of raw, because I mean, there's elements in the show that are deadpan funny, but in the, in the slightest different context, they can be taken quite seriously at the same time. Yeah, I think the, the the judgment call is always if you're okay. This is this is definitely something I've learned with stand up is that quite often, especially if something sad or war does happen, um, if if you've got a a job which exploits your life, you go right. Okay, I'm going to tell everyone on stage tonight, and if you're not okay about it, the audience don't laugh. And human beings are very very astute at reading each other. And so a comedian can't really lie to you. Like uh, if they're dead behind the eyes or if they seem to be, you know, trembling a little bit in their throat, we really know when people are actually not fine. Right. Um, I saw a comic recently doing some stuff about a very recent breakup, like a breakup like two days ago. And, um, and it was really hard to watch, not because she's not a very funny comic, but because everyone in the audience felt really bad. It was just so clear yeah. how hard she was going through is and something we've all been through. And actually, quite often with a bit of time and perspective, and then you kind of treat it as a writing exercise. So you distance yourself from it rather than going into your feelings. That's how you make sure that the audience watching, they have to know, oh, this character or this person had a termination, but this is something they're working through and thinking about, not something they're suffering with. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is always something I like to ask, but I mean, in this business, it's unique because everyone comes to it really as a fan first. And I'm kind of curious in your life, can you sort of think back to a moment or anything that really sort of, sort of flipped the switch for you and said, I want to do this. What, with comedy. Yeah. Well, actually I, I came, um, I, um, 
unlike many comedians, I hadn't really watched any comedy and I didn't really understand it. I was an out of work actor, really, really desperate for any creative outlet because obviously as an, as an out of work actor, you have a proper job, um, you struggle for money, yeah. you really, really feel embarrassed. You never, t- I never ever told anyone I was an actor because the next question would be, what are you doing? And you're like, well, n- not, not acting. And um. And it was in one of those processes that I started doing open mic nights originally with a guitar, just doing singing. And then I realized there were much more gigs around to do stand up. So I kind of wrote a little a little a skit, as you might call it now, um, where about um, how, how different high school the musical was from my secondary school in England. <laughs> and, um, and I did it. And, you know, I didn't get big laughs. Lots of people have like amazing first gigs. What I had was just, you know, 12 people smiling. But the what I would describe as like the neurochemical reward afterwards, like this flood of chemicals. I f- like, I, I feel like my feet didn't hit the ground on the way home. I was floating and I realized what I was supposed to do. And the reason I'm a terrible actor is because I, I want to be myself like on stage. And I realized there's a job where you can do that and you can still kind of pretend, but it's you. And then I realized I, I hadn't even known that was a job. No, and I mean it's it's one of the I always love hearing those stories because it's it's one of those things that you never really sort of appreciate until you're in the moment, like you say, floating and just sort of really have a true clarity of what you want to do. And I mean, watching this show, I can sort of see this very sort of philosophical clarity to the material and just sort of how you're telling the story. And I'm kind of curious when you're putting all this together, is it like do you find sort of that sort of self introspection, that sort of philosoph, almost borderline philosophical bent sort of your style? Yes. Yeah, it is. And and partly it's because I think there's a lot of humor to be found in those areas. And, um, and I also, something I've learned with stand up is you can talk about anything, things that might sound a bit lofty and intellectual on paper. If you say, Oh, I want to make a a joke about Frederick Nietzsche, people might go, Oh, um, that's going to be over people's heads. But actually you can make jokes like that incredibly inclusive by explaining the joke inside it. So no one sits there going, Oh, I, it, 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 I have never read any of Nietzsche's books. I'm excluded. They understand and they feel hopefully clever because they got the joke or they just think the joke's not funny anyway. So is the payoff for you in having a series like this, not necessarily sort of the mass adulation, but seeing those fa- those few faces in the crowd that really do get it and are really sort of getting tickled and getting genuine laughs from the story that you're trying to tell? Yeah, one of the really big journeys with, not just stand up but probably with absolutely every human being who makes anything is realizing again and again that you're never ever going to be liked by everyone actually and even just walking into a party you're never going to be liked by everyone and so I think a, a healthier journey is to try and be some people's favorite and really do what you want to do at the same time there is an awareness of audience but thinking yeah one person saying I really feel like you made this for me or I got this so much that's really satisfying and I think it's the only thing you can focus on because you can't focus on a oh why doesn't that angry man like me (laughs) (laughs) but you know what I just want to say thank you again for the show and I think you're my new favorite because I really did I really got a lot out of the show and it's it's just it was an absolute hoot to watch That makes me very happy. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks again for the time. Thank you.